Hi, my name is Sanchari Ghosh, and I am the Content Specialist at BioArchive at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And I am here today to talk to Yang Dan, who is a professor of neurobiology at UC Berkeley. She's an HHMI investigator and the past recipient of Alfred, Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, the Beckman Young Investigator Award, the SFN Research Awards for Innovation in Neuroscience, and she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in the US in 2018 in recognition of her research on neural circuits that control behavior. So thank you for joining us today, Yang. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and thank you for the amazing talk you gave last week. Um, we learned a lot about neural circuits that regulate sleep um, in, in the mammals. Um, and before we uh, move on, there are a couple of things I wanted to clarify from the talk. So in the first part, you talk about two groups of neurons, the sleep active and the sleep promoting neurons. Um, and um, ultimately the way they exert their effects is by inhibiting the upcoming stream of wakefulness information. Did I get that right? Uh, yeah, so um, generally, you know, I think we're on the same page, right? I just sort of want <laughs> to uh, clarify a little bit. Uh, I guess it, you mentioned the word information. It sort of depends mm -hmm. on what you mean exactly by that, right? Um, right? So I don't think that the sleep neurons necessarily uh, directly suppress things like sensory information, right? Because they okay. don't necessarily project to like the visual system or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that they are also these um, general wake promoting, wake state promoting neurons, including okay. things like um, dopamine, noradrenaline, mm -hmm. histamine, things like that, right? So these right. are all fall into the category of monoamines. So right. these neurons, they their firing rates don't uh, carry a lot of information, uh, you know, the specific Sensory. information about the environment, but they generally right. sort of put the brain in that state Active to better state. process the information, right? So, so that's why, because, uh, you know, you might mean that, but I just wanted to make sure information no, because people you. interpret thank it differently. For, absolutely, yeah. thank you for doing that. So they generally act by inhibiting the active state in the brain. Yes, that's, that's exactly. Different. Yeah, that's okay. how we think about it, yeah. Perfect. And um, just by the way they are named and somewhat by the way the screens were designed, it, it appeared that there might be some sort of hierarchy between the two groups, one merely being active, the other being promoting for sleep. Um, I just wanted to clarify, am I reading too much into that? Or is there some functional basis for some hierarchy? Like, do they function, do they fire at different times when the behavioral states change? Or uh, do they work upstream or downstream of each other? So, so I think that what you mentioned uh, is a totally plausible scheme, right? But in mm -hmm. fact, what we're trying to say is much simpler than that okay. um, because we still haven't figured out all the things, the hierarchy that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I try to convey is that um, the ideal sort of sleep neurons that we're looking mm -hmm. for, they're both sleep active and sleep promoting. Um, okay. So some of the neurons that we have studied satisfy only one criterion, not the other, right? So those we okay. think could still be involved in sleep regulation, right? I think that they are probably involved, but um, mm -hmm. the ideal ones that we're looking for really satisfy both. So oh. the way that we do this is that uh, let's say we screen for sleep active neurons, right? It's a different strategy because you got to label what neurons have been active during sleep, right? Um, but then once we find them, once we confirm that they're sleep active, we also do separate experiments and say, if we manipulate them, do they also promote sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So even though when we screen, we start with sleep active criterion, mm -hmm. but then once we find them, we also test if they're sleep promoting by optogenetically or chemogenetically activate them and suppress them. So we usually do bi-directional manipulation. Um, right. But then when we screen for sleep promoting neurons, 
um, which is based on connectivity, right? Because if they inhibit the wake neurons, then the guess is that they could promote sleep, but we don't right. know, right? So, so once we use the anatomical tracing to find the candidates, we first test and see, you know, if we activate them, do we promote sleep? But once mm -hmm. we once we answer that question, we also mm -hmm. want to do recording or calcium mm -hmm. imaging or something to mm -hmm. see if they're also active at the right time. So the hope is that they're also active during sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. So so yeah. So there. There are some that do both. There are some that do only one. And is there any difference in firing activity that you notice, like temporal patterns or correlations with different states of the behavior? Like I uh, really appreciated the different, clearly different states that you explained in your talk, where it's suppression of motor activity or change of internal state from uh, wakefulness to sleep. So if you could elaborate on that, that would be awesome. Yeah, so the, uh, so what you mentioned, uh, you know, just near the end of your question, um, it, it was about the substantia nigra, pars reticulata, mm -hmm. SNR, right? Um, so we got into that analysis because SNR came up in our anatomical screening for potential sleep promoting neurons. But then mm -hmm. everybody knew, you know, your undergraduate um, neurobiology classes, people hear about basal ganglia, you know, I teach that uh, lecture mm -hmm. uh, at Berkeley. And so I didn't know much about the basal ganglia at all, right? But then it's just like, we were doing whole, whole brain screening and it just this just came up. And, and then I said, well, you know, uh, so, so my former postdoc, Dan Tian, and I, we were talking about it. We were like, we better learn something about movement control because before that, we only heard about those talks, um, you know, fantastic work people have done in the basal ganglia, right? Um, but then we said, well, in our experiment, we can't just have this tunnel vision focusing on sleep because it's right. clearly involved in movement control. So we should take a look at that. So that's what started this whole thing. So in that particular study, uh, Dan Qian, you know, sh now she's running her own lab in Shanghai, um, but she is just brilliant and uh, fearless, right? So she, you know, got into all these new things, like uh, she found a collaborator in China uh, using deep learning to classify the different motor states and inventing all the new analyses and, and so forth. Um, so, so in that study, we sort of found that actually, which we sort of always knew, we just never studied it, right? Which is that sleep is an, not an isolated process, right? It's gotta be linked to all these other things. And, you know, I always knew that before I fall asleep, I gotta gradually wind down, relax a little bit psychologically, right? Um, so you sort of always knew that like from introspection, but right. there was never any rigorous uh, analyses. And so we Analysis. did that for mice. And then we realized that, you know, there is this sort of hierarchical sort of behavioral states and you gotta, you know, move from really active motor to less active motor to quiet wakefulness and then to sleep, right? But I have to say that, you know, that was a pretty recent study. Um, okay. A lot of our earlier studies, we did not do that analysis because, we just hadn't thought about that. Right. right. Um, so I think that in future studies, that's one of the th lessons I learned just going through that study in the SNR, that we got to think about all these other behaviors and how sleep is sort of embedded in this general context of you know, a variety of behaviors and, and start thinking right. about their relationship. But that study right. was sort of special in that way because okay. we just realized that too late. A lot of our earlier studies, we didn't even make necessarily video recordings. So we couldn't even go back and do that analysis. Right, right. So uh, what I'm guessing is that's something that you would like to look at in future about which cells fire when in these. Okay, all right. Yeah, we we'll yeah, look forward absolutely. to Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, just like going on with the thought that you mentioned about um, the whole idea of sleep being embedded in a, in a mesh of different behavioral changes. So in the second part of the talk, you're looking at something that's more autonomic and less like actively motor, right? Um, and 
that is that kicks in a different circuit altogether, right? Um, but when an animal, like you said, when an animal is trying to get to sleep from wakefulness, everything is happening at the same time. Could you elaborate a little bit about how this uh, these two parts are integrated in behavior in in a in an animal who's going to sleep? So you mean the somatic motor and the autonomic motor and the autonomic motor? How are they yeah. coordinated? Uh, yeah, the neural circuit. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the simple answer is that I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So the. Um, we also realize, in fact, this whole thing sort of, you know, fought together fairly recently. Um, mm -hmm. Dan Tian and I, so Dan Tian is the one who did the study on SNR. So she and I um, published a paper, a review paper called the Motor Theory of Sleep. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, so in that paper, in that review, we sort of um, presented our new view of how sleep is organized, right? And mm -hmm. so the main point is that there is no separate special sleep center that's just involved in sleep, right? The, in fact, the take home message of my talk is that sleep is regulated by a very distributed network. And, and what is that right. network? In fact, it contains two parts, right? So one is the somatic motor control at you know the right. each each one is like there's a hierarchy and you find sleep neurons pretty much at every level of the hierarchy the other aspect is the autonomic right mm -hmm. but to get back to your my answer to your question of why i didn't know and that's because this idea came up in fact just a couple months before our review was due. <laughs> and so, okay. you know, we started out not thinking about this and we were just screening and, you know, each postdoc find a candidate and she or he would, you know, characterize it and, and we published right. a paper, right, following the standard protocol. But then, of course, the question always came up when I started giving talks. It's like, why are there so many? And are you just mm -hmm. going to keep going for the next 10 years and finding one more after another? At some point, right. there's got to be a logic, right? So that, right. that question would come up and, and that sort of forced me to think, what does it mean, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, when all of a sudden, it just all followed together, uh, especially mm -hmm. the SNR finding made it clear mm -hmm. that part of the somatic motor control system. Mm -hmm. Once we were looking at all the other regions that we found, you know, hypothalamus we always know, we found amygdala, the periaqueductal gray. And then I was teaching an undergraduate class. And one day I saw this diagram in the Kendall uh, neuroscience textbook. And, nice. and that shows the uh, aut central autonomic network. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, you know, all of these neurons, these regions are pretty much, there's a almost 100% overlap uh, right. with that network, right? So, so all of this came together, this sort of eureka moment came together, probably I would say two years ago, <laughs> um, uh, maybe a bit longer than that, right? And so mm -hmm. then the question came together that, you know, yet, during sleep, right, we do have the reduction of somatic motor activity and reduction of autonomic motor activity. In fact, even when we're awake, these two mm -hmm. are coordinated. There's no doubt about that. You know, once you start running, your breathing rate would go up, not because right. you want to, you, you say, now I'm going right. to breathe, right? Um, right. It, it, they just happen. So all of yeah. that is controlled by the autonomic. Your heart rate goes up and you don't say, I'm going to beat my heart now, right? So all right. of that is autonomic. And so they are always coordinated, which makes mm -hmm. sense. They have to, right? Yeah. But how exactly that's done? Uh, I did some searching in the literature. I didn't find that much. Uh, so I think that this is a terribly important question. It's just that in the past, People, if you're somatic motor, you do that. And if you're autonomic, you do that. Um, mm -hmm. Not too many people have sort of thought about or, 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 you know, made a specific effort to look at how they're coordinated. Um, so I think that the links must be there in the brain, um, but there is that sort of uh, little niche. Uh, in, in fact, you know, I think for young people who are just starting their career, that might be an excellent place to, really look for some interesting connections. Okay, great, great. 
um, that's uh, sorry. Yeah. It's just a really long answer to say. No, I no, 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 no. Why that's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfectly okay. Uh, we love uh, these kind of discussions um, totally. And um, just because your talk was embedded sort of in a, in a biological timekeeping symposium where we heard a lot about clock genes and circadian rhythms um, and sleep being one of the behaviors that shows remarkable pattern, circadian pattern, right? Um, and it is known that it's disrupted when circadian rhythms get disrupted. For example, shift workers go undergoing changes in shifts, jet lag, et cetera. So I was wondering if you're thinking, uh, if you have any thoughts about how these two concepts kind of overlap with each other and how one of the, the, the clock genes or some of their components would integrate with the neural circuits that you were talking about and you know um, explain the diurnal nature of the sleep behavior. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in my mind, it's pretty clear that um, you know it um, sleep has to depend on the SCN, right? The suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? Uh, in mammals, that's where the master clock is, right? Right. Um, so how the how does the SCN, um, you know? So SCN, in terms of circadian regulation, the SCN has got to be upstream, right? Because you don't need right. anything else. I mean, you know, other mm -hmm. things influence it, but SCN itself has its own clock, right? right. So the, and of course, if you take out the SCN, then the animal will just sleep at random times, right? right. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind, uh, the SCN has to be upstream. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, there could be two general ways of how SEN does the control. It could be neuronal, right? Because the SEN, mm -hmm. there are neurons and they right. out of the SEN. Uh, of course, it could also be hormonal, right? I mean, you know, hormone I'm using in a general sense that it's basically some factors that could circulate in the brain or the yeah. whole body, right? It doesn't yeah. have to be a direct synaptic connection. Right, um, right. So in the, uh, in fact, a few years ago, um, because my lab was so much, we know so much more about how to look at the neuronal connections because we're physiologists, right? right? So in right. fact, we made an effort to look at the neuronal pathway. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of run into some obstacles. Uh, some of the Cree mouse lice that we had, we were hoping to target a specific SEN neurons. Um, we had trouble expressing the virus and, and some mm -hmm. other findings were a little bit confusing. Uh, and then the student graduated. And so we just kind of like put that on hold. Um, but it's one of the things that I think, you know, there's no doubt that it's terribly interesting. It's very, very feasible. Um, mm -hmm. So either maybe I'll find somebody later who's interested in that problem, or some other labs really look at uh, look at that. Okay, all right. Um, good to know. Like we're we're talking about such um, important questions that are already in the works, um, and um, I'm kind of nearing the end of my time. So I'm just going to shift gears for the last minute or so um, and talk about a little bit about your experience as a women, successful woman in uh, science and in academia. And given the current environment where people are becoming more and more conscious about the gender disparity that exists and you being a role model as well as a mentor for a lot of women uh, trainees, I was wondering what is that one piece of advice that you would give to women in STEM in early careers, in early stages of their career? Um, what, what would be that one advice coming from you? Um, <laughs> I, um, I mean, you know, uh, I guess it's hard to sort of pick one. Uh, usually when the, my women trainees, or in fact, all my trainees before they move on, we have a talk about, they ask me, uh, you know, for, for, for advice and different people have different questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think maybe for female trainees, the one thing that's sort of in common is um, projecting confidence. Um, I almost feel bad for saying this uh, because in a way I'm saying how you act to the public, right? It shouldn't matter because being scientist, 
we should just focus on our work. It, it, we shouldn't, you know, be so conscious about how we act, right? Um, but I think from my personal experience, um, I think it does matter, unfortunately, in the world that we live in, which is not ideal because how you project yourself does affect mm -hmm. whether you can attract students because if students think that you're not confident, they might not right. want to join your lab, right? Um, so I think that that's probably, like I said, you know, different people wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, to ask different questions, but, but I think that this is probably the one thing that's fairly common among women scientists um, because we, you know, I worry a lot. I'm totally a worrier, right? I mm -hmm. always worry about mm -hmm. there's this idea, you know, every morning I will wake up feeling anxious. What if I'm wrong? You know, what if, what if this, what if that, what if this experiment doesn't work? What if this technique is not as good as I hoped, right? Yeah. Um, but I think, but I think that, you know, we shouldn't let that. I think that being concerned and always having a plan B, plan C, plan D is good, right? right? But we shouldn't sort of, you know, let that affect this confidence aspect, right? Uh, I don't know if I made that point clear, but... <laughs> No, no, no. You, I, I think you did. I think that's that's very useful advice for for women um, who are trying to make their mark in in, in science and are there in the they're in the early early stages of their career where they have to figure out and navigate these um, these issues as well. So I think that's thank you so much. That was that was very candid and uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to us today. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me.